I know many of you in the room, but for those who don't know me, I'm Donna Pavetti, and I work at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and I have spent almost my entire career um, working on um, um, welfare-to-work issues, and um, I was talking to someone today and saying one of the very first projects I worked on was coming to Minnesota, so I have been here for a number of different projects, and I always put Minnesota in the category of being an innovator, and I think that this is just sort of a testament to that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out the day by giving you some context on why we're here and what we hope to accomplish. So just for why we're here, what I want to start with is just a show of hands in the room of how many people have read, heard, had a discussion about brain science and what it means. So we have quite a few hands. Now I want to ask you, how many of you heard that? have heard that um, particularly with relationship to what it means for young kids. And how about how many of you have heard or read or had any conversations about what we've learned about from brain development and brain science and what it means for adults? A good number, so that's good. So what, um, where we are in this field is we're at the very early stages of really trying to understand what we've learned from brain science and what the implications are for adults rather than kids. That it really has been an area that has, that what we've learned, we've learned very much about development for kids and we've learned less about being able to make the translation of what does what we've learned from about kids have to do with adults. And so what I want to do is I want to start with a um, sh very short video presentation um, <laughs> of that was done by the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard. And what happened at the Center for the Developing Child is that the Center for the Developing Child, as you might expect, has focused a lot of energy and effort on really trying to um, get people, um, make sure people understand what we know about brain science and to really make investments in, in young kids. But what happened recently is they really, in doing that work, got to the point of deciding that if we are going to make big impacts on kids, we can't just focus on kids, that we also have to focus on building capabilities of adults. And so this is their theory of change, and we're going to use that to frame the day. So now you can start. Okay. The social challenges that face modern societies, whether it's the ability to work productively, to be a good citizen, stay healthy, have their roots in early health and development. A strong foundation in early childhood results in much better and more effective development later. A weak foundation really puts us behind. The most important thing children need to thrive is to live in an environment of relationships that begins in their family, but also extends out to include adults who are family members in child care centers and other programs. What children need is for that entire environment of relationships to be invested in their healthy development. We've shown from decades of testing interventions that we can improve outcomes. But the magnitude of those impacts is not good enough. Science is now available to help us think about what we might do that would have a bigger impact than the best of what we've done before. So we began to ask, what could we be doing differently? What could we do to be smarter? Children who are at the greatest risk for the poorest outcomes in learning and health and behavior are children who experience a pile-up, the cumulative burden of one after another after another of risk factors. And then the burden is more than any child could be expected to overcome. So we began to focus on the development of the adults. What could we be doing to strengthen the capacity of everyone who interacts with children? This led us to think about the kinds of skills you need to deal with adversity. These skills of focusing attention, planning, monitoring, delaying gratification, being able to solve problems, being able to work in teams, executive function and self-regulation. 
They're also the kind of skills you need to create a well-regulated home and school environment in which healthy development and learning can take place. And then brain science started to tell us that differences in those skills start to develop in infancy based on the environment kids live in. So how do those skills get built? Well, if you don't develop them early, how do you develop them later? Actually, you can build them later because the period of flexibility and plasticity for this part of the brain doesn't fully mature until age 25 to 30. So then the light bulb went on. The reason we're not getting a bigger impact is not because we don't know about how to influence development, but because we're giving information and advice to people who we need to do active skill building with. Skill building by coaching, by training, by practice. But we're not doing that. So we now have developed this theory of change that says we need to focus on the development of the adults who are important in kids' lives. So try this. How does that work? That's a new idea. Buen trabajo. We need to focus on their skills, their needs, in order for them to be better, more effective parents, in order for them to be better prepared to be employable, which would enhance the economic stability of the family, which is also good for children. Second of all, we looked at many people in preschool programs and child care centers. And we said, what are we doing to build those skills in the providers? They need skill building as well. And also the community can help to build and reinforce the capacities that parents need. And the community also includes programs in which the people who work in the programs have sufficient skills. Third of all, what are the major sources of toxic stress in this community and how can we reduce them? Moving it up to a policy level, how are our policies strengthening communities' abilities to reduce source of toxic stress and caregivers' abilities to provide what kids need? The development of our human capital is our future. The development of a productive workforce is our future. The development of a healthy population is our future. This kind of future orientation is critical for healthy society, it's critical for a thriving business, it's critical for a successful environment of relationships to raise children. It's all about being able to plan for the future, to have a future. And that's why this is so important. Okay, so hopefully that gives people some context and also some sort of really sort of exciting things to think about during the day about how can we do what we do differently by thinking about what we've learned about um, from brain science and brain development. So what I want to do now is I'm going to do a very short presentation of just, where's the clicker, of just sort of trying to put this into context and trying to pick up on the theme of why we need to do better and why what we're accomplishing now isn't good enough. So first of all, what I just want to sort of give is just two things that I feel like why brain science is actually important for helping parents succeed. What, have, what are sort of my takeaways? And hopefully you'll have more takeaways. But one is that if you living, we know that living in poverty during childhood impacts brain development. That sort of I think is a give, uh, something that we have a lot of evidence on and a lot of people know. But I think what we don't do is we don't think about what happens to kids when they grow up and they become adults. Those impacts don't suddenly disappear in adulthood. And what this is really about is saying, if we have kids who have grown up and we have had that impact, what can we do and how can we do it differently? And one of the things I think that's important from that video we just saw is that even though the brain is, is impacted, it's malleable and the critical executive function skills needed to succeed as an adult can be built. And even beyond that 25 to 30 period where it's still sort of developing, it doesn't mean that we can't do things. We can, but I think recognizing, you know, what does it mean and what can we do differently if we recognize that is what this is really all about. And then I think there's another piece for me is there really is this sort of separate strand of research that we're not going to talk as much about today, but really has to do with what living in poverty in the current moment does to a family. And there is a whole new body of literature that is coming out from behavioral economics and some of the psychology fields that really have to do with that when you have scarcity, what it does is it puts a tax on the resources you have, on the cognitive resources you have to go about your day-to-day -day life. 
But there are ways that you can reduce that tax in the way that you actually implement programs. And so that it's not a given there either that because people are living in poverty, you can't do something about that. You can in the way you structure things. So those are two things I think that give me hope that we really um, can do things better and differently. So, but why are we in a situation where we really need to think about why do we need to embrace new approaches? And I'm gonna talk about four um, reasons here. One is that even in our best programs, we have modest success. The second is, is that we actually see declining employment among single mothers with a high school education or less. Um, and that's happened for most of the last 10 years. We have a very weak cash assistance safety net. So employment really is the only source of income for many families. And then we also have a very bit of evidence from the adult side that if we teach life skills or executive skills, we can do better. So I'm gonna just show you a chart for each one of those. So here's sort of my chart for modest success. And you'll be, this is sort of of all the years we've been doing research on employment programs for mostly welfare families, but low disadvantaged families. This is what we've seen for steady employment. Um, and I think steady, you know, that sort of steady employment to me is a better measure than just sort of whether we get somebody into the labor market. And if you look at this, first of all, you should all be proud that MFIP is one of the um, programs that has had the most significant impacts over all the years we've been doing research. But if you look at this, the highest we've ever gotten um, with our best programs is that we have 38% of the people who participated who actually have income in four qu consecutive quarters. Now that doesn't mean they've actually worked in all f uh, consecutively for a year, but they at least have been in the labor market and have some income. So that sort of suggests that we have a very long way to go to have really a lot more stability among families, among disadvantaged families. So that's my, you know, my slide on why we have a lot more we can do and should be thinking that even in our most successful programs, we have a lot more to learn. This is my chart that I use to show what's happening to the labor market experience for single women without, with kids and without kids. And I do this comparison because what you can see is if you compare single mothers with single women who have no kids, um, what you see is we have this huge increase in employment from the early 90s up to 2000. And so single mothers early in the 90s were less likely to be in the labor market than women who didn't have kids. But that gap has completely closed, and it closed by 2000. And what you see from 2000 on is we have this steady decline in employment among women who have either a high school diploma or less. Now, the good news here is if we have one more year of data, we start to see this an uptick. So women are actually doing better, and including single men. But so we have this education effect going on, and many of the disadvantaged mothers don't have um, more than high school. And so we're really sort of, we are pushing against a labor market that is a very difficult one to enter. And here is a slide that just shows what's happening. This is national for TANF. Um, of just showing, in 1996, when we enacted welfare reform, there were, for every 100 families who are living in poverty, there were 68 who were served within the cash assistance system. That is now down nationally to 27. Now, the numbers for Minnesota actually look much better than this, um, but they have also declined. So for Minnesota, it's about 80, it's 80-some 80 in 1996, and it's 42 in, um, in 2011. Um, so still, that means less than half of the families in poverty have access to cash assistance. And so what, is, what are they left with? What is their only source of income? It's labor market income. And here is sort of my slide for hope in some ways. So I showed you the slides that had sort of what are the, the, the programs that are held up most often as our most successful. This is a different kind of program. This was a home visiting program that was um, implemented in rural Nebraska that did not focus specifically on labor market outcomes, but focused on teaching skills, life skills, what we often call executive function skills. So it was a curriculum that focused on setting goals and working with families around those goals. It focused on teaching time management. It focused on teaching um, budgeting, um, just a lot of skills that are necessary to succeed in life, both as a parent and as a worker. 
And what you see here is if you look at that very far bar, the highest we saw in the other programs was 38%. And we saw in most places about a five percentage point um, increase from the treatment to control. Here what we see, and this is ever employed for 12 consecutive months, we see this group of families going from 29% to 46%, so there's a huge increase, and it trumps by a significant number of percentage points what we saw in other programs. So this, for me, is evidence that if we focus on building those skills, we can see change in people's lives. And you know, I think we need replication, we need other sort of ways to actually think about this, but I think this also you know, for somebody who has spent their life as a researcher, gives me hope, again, that if we change what we're doing, we can get better impacts. The other thing that is important for this is that these impacts were for the group of families that were served that had the most significant barriers to employment. It was not for the group as a whole, and it wasn't for those with um, fewer barriers. It was those that had multiple barriers. So that's just sort of my um, wanting to giving you some context of why I think it's important for us to just think differently and to take risks about doing things differently. And I think one way to do that is to really think about what have we learned about brain science. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn over the podium to Phil Zalazzo, um, who is, we're very lucky um, to have Phil with us today. Phil is um, a professor at the University of Minnesota's Institute for Child Development, and his work, his life's work, is really focusing on executive function. So he really is an expert in this field. He runs an ex executive function lab, so he's testing strategies. Now, I will say, um, um, Phil's work really focuses on kids, as does most of the neuroscientists who do this work. But I, um, at a conference, was sitting beside Phil, at dinner, and I felt like he could make the translation and really sort of help us to think about how what we know about kids can be applied to adults. And so most of what, again, what Phil's um, experience is around kids. So some of what he's gonna talk about has to do with kids. But what I want you to do and to encourage you to do is as you hear what Phil has to say is to think about what does this mean for the adults in kids' lives. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it, uh, turn it over to Phil, and he's going to give us a, um, um, a presentation on executive function and um, what would be our sort of 101 and what does that mean, and we can then think about what it means for our programs. So Phil, turn it over to you. <laughs> 